Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dan Rome, and this is the Napkin Academy. Today's lesson is going to be a good one. Today, what we're going to be talking about is introducing vivid charts. That's right. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about and drawing charts. Simple idea of why this is important is because we can use charts to represent or replace or complement adjectives. Now, you might say, Dan, have you gone completely out of your mind? Have you gone bananas? Why would we ever want to think about grammar and adjectives? We're here to draw pictures. Well, let's do a quick review and put this in context. All of you know this, vivid thinking. That's what we're here to talk about. Vivid, of course, being the mnemonic that combines visual plus verbal, put them together, interdependent. The idea is we'll be able to think better if we both draw and talk. Why? Because one part of our mind likes to look at the world in terms of words, and one part of our mind likes to look at the world in terms of pictures. Both parts are valid. Putting them together, something we're not typically trained to do, makes us have ideas that are much more clear, easy to describe, and full of impact. We talk about our fox being our word guy and our hummingbird being our flighty picture guy. And what we want to do is get the two of them in balance, the two halves of our mind, so that they can work together and we can combine our words and our pictures. Now, the way we're going to do this officially is we're going to start by saying we've all been trained really, really well in verbal thinking. And let's review then a little bit of verbal grammar, the five-second review, because this is going to be our building block for being able to start to create visual imagery and pictures that have a grammar of their own that isn't made up of just nothing, but is made up of the building blocks of grammar from a verbal side. So quick review. We all know that if we want to say something, here I am, and I want to tell you something. And here you are over here, and you are listening to me, the way that this works, and if I want to write it down, or if you want to try to read it, the way it works is I have a subject, something that I want to talk about, and then I have a predicate. That is to say, I have something, and here's what it does. And then I can modify that thing with pronouns, adjectives, and I can modify how it does its thing through adverbs. Then I can describe where my things are relocated in space through the use of my prepositions and conjunctions. I can represent where my things are related in time by the use of tense. And I can emphasize or make things questions through my use of interjections. So that's how we build sentences. That's how we build verbal communication. That's how we build speaking. That's how we build writing. Fair enough. What we want to do, though, is recognize that sometimes all of that writing or speaking adds up to a lot of blah, blah, blah. And if we can come up with a pictorial way to represent many of those ideas, we will be able to make ourselves a whole lot happier. This is where we brought up the vivid grammar graph, what we're looking at here. And a couple of sessions ago, I asked all of you to draw this with me. The idea being that there are only a limited number of types of pictures that we need to know how to draw. And for those of you that have been with for me for a while, you know that there are actually six types of pictures that we need to draw. And the reason for that is because there are six types of ways that our mind processes information, whether visually or verbally. And so we've got six pictures that can represent all of our ideas. We'll start with the verbal, and then we'll go ahead and turn those back into the pictures. So for example, last time we talked about nouns, which we drew with something we call whoops, portraits. And we spent our entire last lesson drawing portraits to describe nouns. And now we're in this box. We've moved ahead across our grammar graph. And we're going to use our charts as a way to describe our adjective. So let's get clear on that. We've done our portraits last time in great detail. Now we're going to move on to charts. These show the numbers. Let's talk about the numbers. Why do I call these adjectives? Because adjectives are the things that describe, let's say I've got a box. And I drew my box. I drew a little portrait of my box. Well, is it a little box? Or is it a big box? And by the way, 
how many of those boxes do I have? Do I have just one of them, or do I have a lot of them? We already decided that our idea was about a box, but now we're going to go in and start to describe, well, which box is it, what kind of a box is it, and how many do I have? And that's where our charts are going to help us out. The six essential types of pictures, portraits, we know these. We've drawn a lot. Here we're on charts today. Where we're going to go in the future is we're going to start to talk about maps as well, which are going to add in the idea of position. Then we're going to talk about timelines later, because timelines are going to add in the sense of time and tense. And then we'll start to move into flow charts later on, which are going to show a cause and effect. And then we'll move into multivariable plots uh, four or five weeks from now. So today, though, building block number two, charts. As I say, charts become the adjectives of our ideas. Let's say I've written out a long description of some kind of contraption that I really want to share with you. And let's say my contraption is a donut. And I've described my donut. Well, that's great, because I can draw a simple little picture here to say, this is my donut. And isn't that wonderful? Well, the problem is, that's a nice drawing of a donut. And in fact, this little picture, in my mind, carries a lot more meaning than just the word. But they're still a little bit parallel, because now I have a lot of questions. Well, which donut, Dan, are you talking about? Is it a good donut, or is it a small donut, or a big donut, or a sugary donut? This is where our charts are going to be able to help us. Because I could draw a single portrait of my donut, and I could say, there it is. But what if I wanted to say, well, you know, how many of those do I have? I have 12 donuts. OK, that's one way to do it. The other way is I could just draw 12 donuts. And here's my beginning of a chart. I went from, let's talk about donuts, to now let's talk about 12 donuts. And now let's talk about whether I have little donuts or whether I have bigger donuts. And then let's start to add in this idea of, perhaps I have one small donut today, but at some point in the future, I'm going to have a whole lot of different sized donuts. This is what my charts start to do. And this is why I call them adjectives. They provide the additional descriptive information that take us away from saying, oh, I got it, donut, into beginning to say, oh, I know how many. I know how much. And I'm able to think about you know, how big, how does it compare. All kinds of interesting things start to appear when I move from my simple portrait into my chart. Who cares? Why does this matter? Well, for those of you that are in the United States, and maybe some of you that are outside, you're all aware that we've got a presidential election coming up extremely soon. And our two presidential candidates have been through three debates now. And I've got to tell you, the reason why charts matter is because of this. We get these two very smart guys talking. And they start talking to each other. And one of them says one number, and one of them says another number. And I think, OK, well, that's interesting. Which one's right? What does that number mean? And then they throw out another number, uh, 300,000. No, 90 million. And then they throw out another number. Well, 28 times over your presidency, or over the last four years. Now, we've got these numbers building up. And in my mind, I'm starting to get this kind of cacophony, wondering, OK, I understand the individual numbers. But I'm still not seeing what is the underlying picture that either one of these guys wants me to really see. And then they go on. 47% says one. No, 1% 1 says the other. And then one says, it must be less. And one says, it must be more. And then one says, it must be always. And one says, it must be never. And in the end, what we're left with, what I'm left with, is an enormous question mark that says, I understood every one of those individual data points. I fully recognize what four years is. I can sort of comprehend that $700 billion is a lot of money. I can understand the idea of less. I can understand the idea of more. But what I'm missing is what is it that holds all of these together? What is the essential idea that I'm meant to take away that's derived from all of that data? And here's an example of one chart that I thought clarified things that in the most recent debate were not clear. 
As with every chart, one of the most important things we need to know, since a chart is a representation of data, is where did our data come from? So just as a little side note, a little asterisk, whenever we're going to draw a chart from now or in the future, we must absolutely put the source of our information. Because as we're going to see, our charts become so powerful that it's critical for us to know what the source of the information was in order to determine whether it's accurate or to determine if there was some sort of hidden agenda behind the information that's been chosen. So let's look at this particular chart. This is a chart that was drawn by folks at the Strauss Military Reform Project, which you can look up online if you're interested who they are. So here's a chart that was put together by the Strauss Military Reform Project looking at the U.S. Department of Defense budget in 2012 dollars. So accounting for inflation, inflation, over history all the way back to the end of World War II, 1948 through today, and projected a few years into the future. And as we can see, here's what the budget numbers were, and these are billions over here. So we can see that in 1952, about $6 billion in adjusted dollars. Budget went down 57 to about just under $400 billion. And then we can see the numbers going up and down over time. And here's where we sit right now. And so here is where something that was discussed by the candidates in the debate, but now we can make clear. Here's the, the value of a chart is you'll see the green here. The green line on this chart represents the sequester plan. That is to say, uh, it's set up right now in January of 2013. If no other budgetary considerations are taken to place, automatic budget cuts are going to happen, which will mean that the defense budget will go down like this. Okay, that's our baseline. That's what's going to happen unless other decisions are made. Obama is represented here in blue. Here's President Obama's plan. Higher than the sequester plan. You'll see Obama is the blue plan. And then if we go back to red, this is what Romney's plan would do, would actually take the budget up there. So the reason why a chart is important is because we understand that there can be a lot of blah, blah, blah. But when we actually go and look at it, we can see, we can literally see what it is that we're talking about. And now things that when they were just passed along as words were unclear become very clear. As we also know, there are lots of different kinds of charts. Because according to my model, the vivid grammar model, the purpose of a chart is really to do one thing. It is to explain how many, how much, and we can add a little bit more and to say, well, which one and what size. And all charts really do that, how many and how much. We could draw pie charts. We could draw bar charts. We could draw... Uh, histogram. We'll talk about that in a moment, what that means. We can do one of these thermometer thingies that simply says, if this is our total, if this is 100% of what we want, you know, how far are we towards achieving our goal? Simplest chart of all, actually, if we want to show how much and how many of something, is just say, you know, I've got a bunch of X's and O's, and here's how many. I don't have to apply numbers at all. I could just actually draw them out. You know, that's one way to do it and bubble charts. So the point I want to make is there are lots of different kinds of charts. And uh, the question is, well, okay, so which one do I use? And this is what we're going to explore for the rest of our time together. In order to warm up a little bit, I hope all of you have got your standard pen and a piece of paper with you because I'm going to ask you to do a quick little chart drawing exercise with me, just as a kind of a warm-up. Uh, so here we go. Here's how we draw a chart. The first thing we have to do is we have to come up with a set of data. You know, what, what are we comparing? What thing do we want to show the quantity of? Is it our x's? Is it our zeros? Is it squares? Is it people? You know, what, what is the data set that we want to show? That's, that's the first thing we have to do. The second thing we have to do is then we have to create some kind of coordinate system, some system by which we're going to map out the numbers of those things. You know, maybe we would map out uh, circle, uh, squares, circles, and triangles, uh, and then we'll simply represent how many of them we have. So we'll pick one axis as our item. The other axis will be our amount. 
That's our coordinate system. And then we simply map in the data, and then we look at our chart, and we see if some kind of trend has emerged. So that's how to draw a chart. Move away from the theory for a moment. Let's go into practice. Here's what we're going to do. I want us to take one minute and draw a little chart on our piece of paper. And I want you to pick one of these three topics. How many people you work with, draw a chart of that. Or how many emails you have. Or draw me a chart that quantifies the difference between cats and dogs. OK, those are our three. I want you to think about that for a moment. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and draw one. I want to think about which one I have. Uh, I'm going to draw the email one. I'm going to draw email. So while I draw, I'd like you to draw. I'm going to be quiet. I'm just going to draw my picture. OK, I've drawn my chart. So let me just walk you really quickly through the chart I drew, just to give you a sense of uh, you know, how do we go about drawing a chart. OK, I decided I was going to draw a chart of how many emails I have. So I picked my data set as, well, you know, number of email. And I was thinking that uh, what makes sense to me is to show not just the total number of email I have now, uh, but to show how that's changed over time. So I set up my coordinate system by saying, well, one axis is going to be time, and the other one's going to be the number of emails that I have. And as I was starting to draw this, I thought, well, what would be most interesting to set a baseline is if I go back to the year 1990 when I had no mean email at all. None of us had any email, and that would set our baseline at zero. So in 1990, the number of emails I had was zero. And then I thought, well, let's block it out in 10-year segments, and that brings us up to today. So uh, from zero up to zillions, you know, an unmanageable number. By the year 2000, I had an unmanageable number of emails. And as, I, as far as I remember, for the entire decade of up to 2010, I always had an unmanageable number of emails. And I would imagine that most of you are probably in the same boat. But then over the last two years, I have brought my email down to what I'm going to call a manageable limit. And I've been able to do that. Uh, in part because I've become a big fan <laughs> of a time management system called Getting Things Done by a guy named David Allen. If anybody's not familiar with Getting Things Done by David Allen, I'm not here to sell anybody on anything, but he has a really brilliant approach to time management. And a big part of time management today is email management. So he has some interesting tools and shortcuts and things like that. And basically what I've done is I set up a series of filters. I set up a series of lists. I set up different email addresses. Aha! Some of those I look at all the time. Some of them I look at more rarely. And then I've also set up something called the two-minute rule, pulled directly from David Allen, which says if you have a few minutes and you're sitting there with nothing better to do, and you look over your email, if there is an email that you can deal with in the next two minutes, just deal with it. And do it right then. Don't put it in another folder. If you can deal with it right now, it's, it's the term for this, of course, is sort of uh, cognitive triage. <laughs> How do you deal with things? And basically, according to David Allen, there are three groups of things. 
You put things into trash right away. You have those that you can respond to in two minutes, and then those that have to go into holding. And you know what you do is you become ruthless of just throwing away anything that you're, you're simply not going to deal with. If you can respond to something in two minutes, do it right now. And then the rest of the stuff goes into holding, and that becomes a manageable part. So there we went off on a complete tangent that I didn't intend to, but that's the power of a chart, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you can take a couple of data points, lots of email, too much email, you know, put it into a chart, and all of a sudden we've got something interesting to, uh, to talk about. And let's go back to this question of, okay, we know how to draw charts, we've warmed up, but again, wow, there sure are a lot of different kinds of charts out there. What we're looking at here, of course, is a screenshot from Excel, Microsoft Excel. I'm sure that all of you have used Excel at one time or another. And you know that Excel is great at generating charts, but oh my gosh, yikes. You know, look at this. I just wanted to draw a chart. Which one am I going to draw? Am I going to draw some of these column charts, uh, these line charts, these pie charts, bar charts, area charts? Uh, scatter plots, stock charts, surface diagrams, donut charts, bubbles, radar charts, what the heck are those? You know, it's crazy. All I want to do is show number, right? That's what my chart does. I want to show number in a meaningful and an insightful way. Which chart would I use? Well, I've got an alternative view to say, let's not worry about whether it's a column chart or a line chart or a pie chart or a bar chart or an area chart. Let's forget that. Because there's a more insightful way to think about which chart would I want to draw. And it's something I want to share with you now. I'm going to call this my chart of charts. Our data set are charts, different kinds of charts. Pie charts, bar charts, column charts, line charts, surface charts, etc. I don't care about that. What I care about are the number of dimensions of information that a chart shows. What are the dimensions of information? Well, what, the heck, what, what, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go ahead and make on our chart the number of dimensions of information be our vertical axis from one dimension to two to three to four to five and so on. So as we go up the side, we're increasing the dimensions of information. And I'm not talking about whether that's uh, x, y, z. I'm not talking about uh, sort of three-dimensional space. When I talk about dimensions, I simply mean another layer of information that I'm putting on top of my stack. And now to compare, let's talk about the level of insight that the chart gives me from very little insight, from a small amount of insight, sort of a small aha, uh -huh, let's make a small exclamation point, to great insight, enormous insight, meaning a really huge exclamation point. Down here I say, ah, OK, I learned something. Thank you. Over here I say, oh my gosh, look what I've learned. That's fantastic. So let's go through the chart now. A one-dimensional chart is one that contains one piece of information, one measurement. That's a better way to look at it, one measurement. So a little pie chart says, out of 100%, what percent do I want to show? One, to one measure. A bar chart or a pie chart, or a, rather a column chart, typically shows the same thing. I have some objects, and I have one measure about them. I have quantity. Okay, That's a one-dimensional chart. I'll give you examples of all of these as we go. A two-dimensional chart is one where I actually have two different things that I'm measuring. So this might be an example of a stock chart. Because I'm measuring time and I'm measuring amount. So now I'm comparing two measures to each other, hence the term a two-dimensional chart. And guess what? My insight goes up incrementally. I learn a little bit from a pie chart. I learn a little bit more from a stock chart. Well, let's continue. What might be a three-dimensional chart then? Well, how about I take time or some measure, another measure, maybe dollars, and then I actually use the size of my data to add in an additional measure, such as, um, uh, I don't know, market share or something like that. Now, I've got a three-dimensional chart, 
And I'll give you an example of that. Then what would be a four-dimensional a four chart? I'm laying together four different measures now. Well, I could take um, my chart, my three-dimensional chart, and then come up with an additional measure, and then maybe make time something that actually allows for movement. So I could scroll back and forth in time and see how my discrete data sets change according to these two different measures. Wow, that would give me some great insight. And then finally, a fifth dimensional chart where I take that and I just start adding in more dimensions and I put them on one axis grid. And now I've actually got an entire data world on one axis. OK, now this is very abstract because I haven't shown you examples, but I want to. But before I do, there's another challenge here. And this is why what is now a 2D chart, this is a two-dimensional chart right now, is about to become a three-dimensional chart because there is another axis we could overlay on here. If we're comparing riches of insight, yeah, let's keep that. But let's also add visual complexity. And the parallel to visual complexity, which is speed of understanding. And as we go into greater and greater insight and more dimensions, we're actually increasing our visual complexity. Oops which means we are slowing down the speed of understanding. So what does this tell us? Fast is down here, and slow comprehension is up here. Why do we love a single little pie chart that only gives us one dimension of information? Because it's super simple to understand. We look at it, and we say, boop, got it, 10%. Ooh, but as we increase our insight, it takes us more time to understand what the chart actually contains. Let's look at examples to make this real for us. Because what I want you to do is I want you to be able to say, instead of a line chart or a bar chart, when you have information and data, something that you've measured that you want to display, I want you to feel comfortable saying, I could make any one of these charts based on collecting the data that I have. And I know, based on who my audience is and the speed with which I must communicate with them, where along my multidimensional axis am I going to sit. Let me give you an example of each kind. A one-dimensional chart. I have not eaten. There's my pie. That's the amount I haven't eaten. I love this chart. It's a pie chart about pies. And what does it give us? One piece of information. What? So I want to give you an example of a two-dimensional chart now. We're doubling the amount of information, and we're increasing tremendously the kind of insight we got. Our little pie chart was lovely. Here we have the Yahoo stock price as of today. Why Yahoo? Well, for those of you that have been with me for a while, you know that I love tracking Yahoo as a great uh, example. In fact, if anybody's interested in changes in Yahoo, um, go back and watch one of our previous associate uh, case studies. And we spent the entire time doing a whole series of charts that, trans, uh, that, that uh, track the history of Yahoo. So here we have it, the last couple of years from 2008. Stock price now, here's the price in dollars, from $30 to $10. And over time, right up to today, we've seen the stock price go up and down. Huge tank back there just before 2009. Lots of management changes, et cetera. And of course, things were starting to go down. Uh, through the summer until it's now started to come up again. Look at that. Yahoo price is coming up. Why? Because Marissa Meyer, formerly of Google, has taken over as CEO. So kind of capping our previous story about, you know, who's the CEO of Yahoo? Two months ago it was a big crazy story. Now we know. Marissa seems to be doing some good things. She's had one earnings call, and although earnings were off, you know, there's confidence in her ability to do something good with Yahoo. So that's what I mean by a 2D chart. Time and amount. So we can track amount and get some insight as to trend. The ultimate takeaway from this is trend. Do we see a trend emerging? So that's a 2D chart. OK, so let's now, uh, let's now go ahead and get a three-dimensional chart. All we need to do to create a three-dimensional chart is take our 2D chart and add another dimension of information. In this case, we've got volume of traded shares. Uh, 
and the beauty, of course, why this is kind of a nice little looping thing, is here's the value of Yahoo, and I pulled all of this, of course, from Yahoo Finance, which is the site that gives uh, beautiful charts like this for uh, all companies, all corporations, and I just happen to have it be self-reflective. Hey, Yahoo Finance, look at Yahoo. This is what it gives us. So now our 2D chart, time, amount, gets added with time and number of shares traded. Aha. This gives us some additional information, doesn't it? Look at this. When the stock was tanking, lots of people were trading. Oof. Look at this. The stock did badly. Lots of trading, and then the stock started to come up way back in, uh, well, a long time ago, back in uh, early 2008. So now we've turned our 2D chart into a 3D chart, and we've got more information that we can share. Uh, and this little timeline down here, which is really just another dimension of information, this allows us to see the time period over which this chart shows us. So if I was to pull this little slider back out across, of, of course what I'd be able to see is I would see this stock chart, you know, give me more and more years of information. So that's what I mean by a 3D chart. Okay, well, if that was a 3D, what would be the next type of chart we'd want to look at? Uh, I'm guessing that the next chart would be a 4D chart, right? So we're going to now look at uh, layering in more types of measures. This is the best in the world, the best four-dimensional type chart, gapminder.org, gapminder.org from Hans Rosling. If you are someone who likes data visualization, you must become familiar with Hans Rosling at gapminder.org. Uh, and if you want to get to know Hans quickly, just go, of course, to famousoldted.com, our TED Talks. Hans Rosling's given two talks. Watch them. And he'll give you the best explanation ever of what this 4D chart is. Now, the other thing you remember, as we add in additional layers of measurement, things become more visually complex, and they take greater time to understand. Uh, so what are we looking at here? Oof, I want to run. There's too much information. Let me quickly, quickly walk you through this. On the horizontal axis, on a logarithmic scale, we're plotting out how much money people make on a national basis. Gross uh, uh, domestic product per person. How much money do people make? On the vertical axis, people's health based on life expectancy. So between those two, what Hans Rosling has done is map in all of the countries on Earth. So I know that there are many people who are here from India. So let's look at India. So here's India saying that the per capita income looks to be about $3,000 a year, and average life expectancy is about 65 years. Uh, we're in the United States. Let's go up here to this part of the scale. Average income is about $45,000 a year. Average life expectancy is about 80 years. So there we see a difference between India and the United States. Here's China in the middle. You know, it's the big one. Uh, here's Russia for anybody who's interested. Here's South Africa down here. Look at that. South Africa's different. Fairly high per capita income, uh, over $10,000, but very low, relatively low life expectancy. So those are two dimensions of data. But now we add in a third dimension. The size of the circle represents population. Ooh. So now we see that you know, India and China have big populations. So now we've added another piece of information. Now let's add in another one, color. The color represents which continent or which global position uh, geographically that country is occupied. So isn't it interesting? Most of these dark blue countries down here where we have low life expectancy and, and lower income seem to be located in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. Hmm. These yellow countries up here higher uh, life expectancy, higher income, tend to be located North and South America, Russia, of course, in orange. Uh, so here we have another piece of information. Now, but what truly makes this a 4D chart, and the only way you can experience this is you have to see it live, so you have to go to Gapminder, is what Hans Rosling does is he adds the element of time. Because let's face it, this image is just a snapshot of the position of countries in terms of life expectancy and income in one year, in the year of 2010. But what you can do at gapminder.org is slide the time scale back and forth 
and look at how these countries move going all the way back, I think in some cases, to the 1800s. And you, that is when you get extraordinary insight. India may be behind China in terms of life expectancy and gross domestic product. And they may both be behind the United States. But if you were to look at how it goes over time, both of them are moving this way. And, it, and this one is staying in the same place. Fascinating. That's a 4D chart. Now we want to come to a five-dimensional chart. And now I must uh, pay homage to the greatest uh, uh, curator of data visualization information ever. I'm sure that most of you know who I'm talking about. If you don't, we're talking about the gentleman named Edward Tufte, a uh, former professor of statistics and politics at Yale University, uh, who over the last 25 years became fascinated with data visualization, self-published, self-published, holy smoke, self-published a series of four books that have become uh, breakthrough bestsellers. Now, best-selling self-published books of all time, in fact, uh, all about data visualization. And probably the most famous data visualization that Edward Tufte ever talks about was not drawn by him. In fact, there's very little drawings that Tufte did himself in any of his books. What he's great at is finding data visualizations that other people have done through history, and then he explains them. Uh, but the most famous one of all is this chart right here. The ultimate five-dimensional chart, five plus, actually I think as we count through, we're going to find that there are probably seven different dimensions of measures within this chart. For those of you who don't know what we're looking at, we're looking at uh, Charles, Menard, Minard, let me draw that for you, Frenchman, visualization of Napoleon's march on Moscow in the year of 1812, one of the most famous data uh, visualizations ever because of how much it shows. Now let me walk you through what we're looking at here. The tan this is a map. There's actually a map here. This is the river that forms the border of Poland. And here's Moscow over here. So we can imagine the whole sweep of the European steppe coming across from the border of Poland, the rivers, see the rivers here, all the way to Moscow, tremendous distance. So what Napoleon decided to do was take his army, which started out with 442,000 troops. This tan line, the width of the tan line, represents how many soldiers did Napoleon have at the beginning of the year he started here at the border of Poland, and he started marching towards Moscow. And some of his soldiers took a detour up here. And as he continues on towards Moscow, you'll see that uh, his numbers are coming down, but nothing too shocking. You know, by the time he reaches the midway point, ooh, maybe that is scary. He's down to about half the soldiers that he started with. That means the other half have died. The other half have died along the way as they're marching towards Moscow. Now, let's add in our next dimension of data. You see this line down here? This is temperature. This is cold. This is very, very cold because winter is starting to come in. So as Napoleon continues to march in and his troops, his numbers dwindle, by the time he gets to Moscow, he's got 100,000 troops. One-fourth the number that he started with. And here we can literally see the troops dying off as they march across the steppe and things are getting colder and colder. Massive losses here. Well, Napoleon, of course, has his battle at Borodino. Uh, uh, takes Moscow, in fact, but the, the Muscovites burn Moscow down, so there's really nothing for him to take. It's debated to this day who actually won the battle at Borodino. The Russians say the Russians won. The French say, you know, Napoleon people say Napoleon won. It's a moot point. It doesn't matter because the fact is when mo there was nothing left for Napoleon's troops to live off of by the time they got to Moscow. So taking Moscow did absolutely nothing. Their only option was to just head home, and that's the black line as he starts to make it home. As he starts to come home, look at the number of troops. He's got so few by the time he makes it back. This group that at Polsk had separated off meet up again as they make their way back. By the time he gets back to the river, he's down to 10,000 troops. Why is this a five-dimensional chart, and why is this the most famous data visualization ever? I've just taken six minutes to describe something that normally takes vast amounts of information, and here we can literally see it. So that's what I mean by a fifth dimensional chart. 
But the downside is it did take me six minutes to describe it. The insight, wow, geographic features mattered. Temperature mattered. Distance mattered. Numbers mattered. I've got an entire, <laughs> I've literally got the novel of War and Peace in front of me in a picture. This is what it's about. It took me a few minutes to describe it, but the insight is extraordinary. So here's what I recommend you do, and then we're going to wrap this up, let you go with some, some, uh, some new homework to do. When the time comes to take your set of data and make it clearer to yourself or make it clearer to somebody else, I've got this idea. It's repre represented by this set of data. Do a build. This is the way that we compensate for the fact that increasing levels of measurement, increasing dimensions, let's, let's write it that way, increasing dimensions lead to increasing complexity. Do it as a build. What I mean by that is tell, here's my other axis, here's my set of data. Got it so far? Yeah. Okay. Let's map in my first set. Oh, look at this. It's interesting. Let's map in my third set. What I mean is we do a build. We get to tremendous insight from multiple dimensions. By, without having to stop and worry about the complexity. Last charts are great. Absolutely, we understand that. Think of the insight and the power we can have from a simple chart. Question, last thought number two, which chart do we use? Well, let's use them all. Let's do them as a build. Increasing the complexity as we go. Which brings us to thought number three. What do people really want? Is they really want insight. If a simple one-dimensional chart delivers the insight, further and take the people with you. Do the build as you go it becomes magic and you will be able to take someone who at the beginning didn't know anything about your idea and at the end is saying, oh my gosh, I now feel like a genius. Let's go through our homework for the coming week. I'd like us to practice drawing some charts. Two steps in this homework. The first one is I'd like us to warm up by drawing three basic charts. Uh, one is just uh, how's the weather this week? Second chart would be uh, how much free time do you have? You know, free time versus work time. And third chart, uh, how many people are in your family? Small family, nuclear family, extended family. Draw us a chart that shows how many people are in your family. Those are our warm-ups. And then for our real main attraction, let's go ahead and do a build. A chart moving from a one-dimensional to a two, to a three, to a four-dimensional chart illustrating your career. So let's start with a single measure, something like your job title. Uh, let's say, for example, I was a uh, chef. So let's say uh, now we start with that title, and then let's uh, layer in some more piece of information. Let's layer in some timing, perhaps the years that I did these jobs, that location, you know, where, where was I? Uh, and then an income, and let's just keep that general. Let's just put the categories as uh, little or a lot. You know, it's never enough, no matter how much you earn, so that's not a valid measure. And then go ahead and layer in your personal satisfaction. And what we're going to end up with is some kind of chart with multiple dimensions, some five-dimensional chart, time, location, however you want to handle that, satisfaction, however you want to handle that, various careers and maybe income, something that gives us some real insight into your own career. In the picture, can you walk us through, this was the last homework summary from Portraits, can you quickly take us through what we're looking at? Sure, on the, on the right-hand side there are uh, three graphics, one of a, a water well, a bridge with water underneath and in sort of faint lines there's a fountain. And I just try to do it 
serendipitously it came out thematically with water, but I just like the shapes of them. Mm -hmm. Then on the left hand side or next to that there are two portraits, one of Moses and one of Confucius. I just wanted to get a different, um, just a couple of different cultures, tried to make them you know, two different images. So one is like you know Old Testament Moses, the other is Eastern Wisdom of Confucius. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the uh, the the Who narrative map. Uh, I chose a, a play by Shakespeare, which most people are probably familiar with. Well, most of us, many of us, studied at school, and this is on Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark. And as we were instructed, I just went through and took the first character as they appear in the different scenes and. You have an opening scene with some soldiers and there's this ghost that appears on the battlements. And this is actually Hamlet's father, although we don't find that out until the second or third scene. And then the other four portraits you have below that on the left, you have Hamlet who's the, the star of the, the play. And then to the right of that you have Hamlet's mother, Queen Gertrude. And below that, that fierce looking person, you have Claudius who's actually the, the husband of Queen Gertrude but the brother of the father of Hamlet, and that's where this drama starts to develop. And then right below that you have Horatio Hamlet's friend, who's a very important character who actually is with Hamlet at the beginning of the story and at the end of the story. So it's um, just a nice set, you know, several pictures that just do what we're instructed to do, just introduce the people as they come into the play or the story or the nonfiction, and uh, just do one's best to try and represent them visually. Did you enjoy doing this, John? Very much. You know, I, you, 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 uh, you're uh, among the handful of people that have been really diligent about sending in your homework. So if you haven't been doing your homework, other folks, I'm, I, you do get recognition if you send in your homework. Uh, I can see that your, your work is improving dramatically over time. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, this drawing of Moses and this drawing of Confucius and your three, your well, your bridge, and your fountain are magnificent. I, I don't know if you've done a lot of drawing in the past, but... Uh, the amount no. of information that you convey with the simplicity of what you've drawn, magnificent. Are you someone who's done a lot of drawing in the past? No, I've done very little drawing. I used to, at school I did a little bit of drawing many years ago, but I, I'm actually, it's, it's through this course, uh, and through this instruction, that I think we're all getting the opportunity to, to cultivate skills that are latent but we really haven't drawn upon. And you know, often because just of embarrassment, we think, I mean, you can see on the left-hand side, these are fairly primitive graphics. But on the right-hand side, I just thought, no, I think I can, I can execute these reasonably well. They're beautiful. These drawings are, are as good as I've seen. These, these, you know, these are beyond publishable. You should, you should be working on a book that explains something that's of interest to you. Maybe it's uh, history or, or Shakespeare. I encourage you to go ahead and start working on a book. You know, this is great. I'll introduce well, you, you to my much. agent. <laughs> get, a, get a proposal together. All right, so, I'll do that. <laughs> that's wonderful. Okay, John. Those are excellent. Uh, and so with that, I want to thank you again for your time. Hey, thank you all for another great lesson. This is Dan signing off from the Napkin Academy. But don't go away. Now on our new platform, you can still submit your homework. Debbie, our community manager, is going to join you right now to show you exactly how to do that. And I really encourage you, do your homework. Okay, take it away, Debbie. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this Napkin Academy classic video. We've made it easier than ever to share your homework. After you've completed your homework and have a JPEG or PNG file saved on your computer, come back to this course. Once you're back here, scroll to the bottom of the screen, and in the comments box, you can add a comment. I'm just going to call this one my homework. You can also add images by clicking on the Insert Edit Image button here. In the source box, click on the file. In the Images window, click on Upload, and then click on Add Files. This is going to take you to your computer where you can search for your images. I'm just going to search for mine in pictures, and I'm going to choose this image here. You can also add multiple images here. Click Upload. After the upload is complete, click Close. Then scroll down. And you'll see that the last image is here, and it's checked. This is the one we just uploaded. Click Insert. I suggest in the Dimensions box you change the maximum to 1,200 pixels, 
and leave the constrained proportions box checked. You can also add an image description here if you'd like. Click OK. You'll see that your image has been added to your comment. And now the last step, the most important one, make sure that you click the green comment button here to upload your homework to the Napkin Academy. We hope to see your homework soon.